Fantastic. Right. So this is really the promise of what we're talking about, simplicity and speed. In-memory transaction processing, though, is a little bit more complicated. Life becomes a little bit more complicated, because what's added into the mix is a need for not only speed and simplicity, but also not to compromise this with what we call durability and consistency. Because as soon as you add durability and consistency into the mix, which are really complicated to implement, and everybody who has implemented a data management system in the world will tell you that, um, speed and simplicity go out of the window. Because you have to manage things like concurrency. You have to ensure you have asset semantics and the atomicity of it all. And how do you manage durability without compromising on performance? And it is complicated. So in, ex in transaction processing systems, the challenge really is that how do you ensure durability and consistency while at the same time not compromising on speed and simplicity? Because if you compromise on speed, you are compromising on the power of what memory gives us which is what we want to harness at its fullest. So what is extreme transaction processing? Extreme transaction processing goes beyond transaction processing. And extreme trans transaction processing is effectively to operate at memory speed. When you're actually working in, say, a system that is going and updating an object in memory in a data grid, you're not operating at memory speeds. You're operating faster than what is a database, an RDBMS, or a, a disk, but you're not operating in memory speeds because you're constrained by networks. You're constrained by synchronous hops. You're constrained by replication that needs to be done in order to stabilize the information that you are putting into that grid. If I want to operate in memory speeds, I am talking about microseconds. I'm talking about nanoseconds. I'm not talking milliseconds or seconds anymore. That is really operating at memory speeds. That is leveraging and harnessing the full power that is at our disposal to do in-memory computing, and specifically in-memory transaction processing. However, extreme, the extreme aspect of extreme transaction processing is not only about speed. It is about all the elements that are listed there. It is about operating in memory speed without compromising on the simplicity that in-memory computing gives us without compromising on the durability of the data, without compromising on the consistency that is required for our transactions, specifically for very complex transactions. And finally, very importantly, not being able to compromise on scale, which has been the biggest issue that some of the traditional architectures have. Now, in order to do this, you can't just change the technologies you use in your application architectures in order and, 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 and achieve that. You can't, for example, take a traditional application architecture, which I'm going to go through and walk through step by step, and expect that by replacing certain elements, such as an RDBMS, or, um, or basically getting a higher speed network, or clustering your servers, you'll be able to achieve uh, these, this promise. You have to be able to need to consider the change in the architecture, because it is the architecture that needs to actually leverage the memory correctly. It's an optimal usage of the memory that actually will result in the extreme performance and the extreme non-functional aspects of the application that we so desire. Because, so far, all application architectures that have been developed have been developed around the technologies that existed. Around, for example, the presence of RDBMSs, and the presence of HTTP, and the presence of application servers, and the presence of two-phase commit. Those technologies are the ones that actually propel the architecture that actually is in place. But now when memory is becoming a first-class citizen for us to work with, and not just quote-unquote a cache, we need to consider how we change our architecture in order to tap into it. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So how extreme are we talking about here? Right? I mean, when we, and, and, and first of all, I mean, when I talk about extreme, I'm not talking about theor theory here. There are real-world real world systems out there that demand what is here. And so there is real-world demand 
for this. What is the scale that we're talking about? We're talking about tens of millions of orders in application working set. I'm using orders as an example, like for example, an order processing system, e-commerce system, a trading system on Wall Street. You're talking about tens of millions of orders. You're talking about terabytes of memory that are actually used in order to store this state that actually the applications are going to be functioning against. The very important part, that it scales linearly with the business. Businesses are growing. Volumes are only a part of the business that grows. With volume grows data, grows the size of data. And therefore, whatever architecture is put in place needs to actually scale both with volume and size. The performance of an extreme system is hundreds of thousands of order transactions a second. We're not talking about few thousand, 10,000. In the past, it used to be a few hundreds. It became thousands, then tens of thousands, now hundreds of thousands. We're talking millions of transactions per second. And transactions, we're talking durability. We're not talking about in-flight transactions that are, non that, are, that are volatile. We're talking about durable transactions a second. We're talking about with these kind of transactions, we are talking about microseconds to low milliseconds processing times, not seconds anymore. Google has changed the world for us even when it comes from a web scale standpoint. It was, used to be a thing of the past where we could actually say, yeah, seconds response time is good when I actually build an e-commerce system. Google gives you like millions and millions of search results in a matter of a fraction of a second. People are expecting that off our systems today. Forget about Wall Street, this is just in any industry. So you're talking about microseconds to low millisecond processing times, hundreds of thousands to millions of transactions a second, and with reliability where nobody is going to allow you to lose anything. Failures is not an exception anymore. Failures is actually becoming the norm. People are actually using failures in order to test their systems into production, ironically, but that is the way it's actually happening. And finally, the most important one is this, I think. There was, a, there was some time in the past, back in 2008, when I was actually starting Neve, where I, I was talking to a developer. And we were talking about the promise of in-memory computing. Uh, because at that point in time, 64-bit computing was coming about, networks were becoming faster and faster, and there was a ca the capability of harnessing memory in order to do transaction processing was becoming a bigger and bigger reality. So I was talking to a developer saying that, you know what, in-memory computing is actually going to happen. It is going to happen. And the person said, what is in-memory computing? I said, it'll be a point where you will think of memory as uh, durable. It's not volatile anymore. It's durable. And that person said to me, and it's a very clever statement, which has kind of stuck with me since then, is that, you know what? I can write Java just thinking memory is a disk. I don't have to worry about persistence. I don't have to worry about durability. I don't have to worry about anything. I just write my Java code like I'm doing a proof of concept. That's production worthy. Because I can assume memory is my disk. That level of agility is what extreme computing is all about. In trading systems, when people actually build algos, these algos are actually tested in production. Because they don't actually can never test the viability of an algo until you actually have real data. This is actually happening in many other systems because we just cannot mimic the kind of data that we get in production in our testing environments. So, so when they actually want to write a new algo, if they could just treat Java, writing Java and writing it memories as a disk, you know what? I can test my software in production and that cycle of test change, test change through production becomes so agile, it basically propels your business. That's why this is of so much value. It's the agility that allows for people to treat the amount of memory that you have as durable so that I can produce extremely agile code and my whole development cycle becomes agile, plus allows my entire workforce to focus on what is really matters to them. My business should be focused on business logic. My business should not be focused on infrastructure. So therefore, if I can get this, it is actually one of the biggest things, I believe, of all when it comes to extreme transaction processing. OK, so let's talk about um, some of the, uh, the I mean, I'm going to go through all these application architectures uh, one by one. So if you look at a traditional application architecture, this is what you see. This is what typically has existed, which, as I said, was built around the technologies at play. A relational database, which serves as your storage tier 
for your kind of relational, uh, sorry, your reference as well as your transactional state. You have a set of application kind of, an application tier that hosts your business logic that is operating off that data, and some kind of a messaging tier that actually dispatches these messages from your environment to trigger the processing of transactions. I mean, thinking e-commerce systems, think in application servers, those kind of applications. There are lots of things that are wrong with this, but everybody in this room, I think, knows what's wrong with this because this is what actually has resulted in ORM systems and then subsequently to the in-memory revolution that I, I think we're in the middle of. So relational databases are a choke point. They are a choke point because they are slow. They are slow because they are synchronous, they are monolithic, they're disk-based. We all know that they can't do more than a couple of hundred TPS, even if they're really, really pushed. And they are complex because you have to pepper your code with all sorts of SQL statements, which actually SQL is simple, but you know, writing code that's, that's SQL based is not necessarily the most friendly thing in the world, compromises your agility, and this does not scale with size or volume. So this is your bottleneck from across the board. On the messaging tier, typically you know, these applications that are built out, they're built out using HTTP JMS, they're synchronous technologies. JMS is actually a synchronous technology unless, of course, vendor-specific extensions allow for it to become asynchronous. And because they're synchronous, um, they're slow, and also they have what is called poor routing. If you're using HTTP, there really is no routing mechanism. So what happens is that because of the lack of routing here, and because this is slow, there is kind of a half-baked effort to scale the system by basically trying to do a horizontal scale of the business logic. That horizontal scale of the business logic doesn't necessarily work very well because all you'll end up doing is adding more and more load onto the choke point. And that choke point is not going to get alleviated unless you throw an extreme, an army of people at this tier in order to maintain it. But at that point in time, your costs drive up to a point that you abandon the entire application, which is sort of the traditional problem that's happened. ORMs tried to solve this problem to a certain extent by launching objects into memory and then trying to map it to databases. It didn't really do that much because it still maintains it to be synchronous. Um, and the scaling strategy that is put in place is also incorrect because you're scaling for volume here because you have to do it round-robin. You have no kind of routing capabilities that exist. And that doesn't allow you to necessarily scale the business. As the business grows big and as your business starts becoming larger and larger, this still remains your choke point. So what you land up with these architectures, it's slow, it doesn't scale, it's very complicated. However, it is consistent and it is durable. That is the power of RDBMSs. They've always been durable and consistent. The next step in the evolution of, of, um, these, of these applications was to sort of take an in-memory sort of replicated data grid slash data cache and launch that into memory and sort of replace the database, thinking that it'll help you. And it does. It does to a certain extent. What happens is that from a performance standpoint, you get better performance than a database. It'll go from hundreds TPS to maybe, maybe 1,000, couple of thousand TPS. Your latencies are still in kind of seconds or high 100 mic, uh, milliseconds. Um, it is simpler. You don't have to pepper your code with SQL statements, just like ORMs are. Um, but uh, you can still work purely with objects. However, uh, because this scaling strategy remains the same, the only way to scale the system is basically going horizontal, which essentially means a lot more concurrent threads running in the system in order to actually get more pipelines in order to function. Those pipelines result in a lot more concurrency hitting the business logic, which means that you have to do very sophisticated transaction management to manage the isolation as well as the durability and concurrency of these transactions that you're working with. So even though the applications start becoming simpler, they are still not 100% pure domain logic. They have some kind of infrastructural footprint, which is about management of transaction boundaries in order to make sure the consistency of data, managing isolation levels in your, in your uh, replicated data store, to ensure consistency. Consistency is the hard part at this point, not necessarily just the durability or the flexibility of, of uh, manipulation of the data, which becomes very simple with objects. In a system such as this, you do not necessarily scale with size again, because an in-memory replicated store is constrained by the amount of memory you have on your bank of machines, because it is going to replicate everything that exists. 
And therefore, you cannot just drop in more machines or more resources when you hit a scaling point. The scaling point that you hit, a definition of a system that actually scales, that when you hit a point that is choked, you should be able to throw more resources into the system in order to allow it to breathe again. This doesn't. Because the only way you can throw it is more memory. And yes, you can throw more memory, but you know, memory is still, to a certain extent, expensive. And you won't necessarily keep yourself below it. And there are many technologies that don't, don't even work with so much memory. I mean, JVMs have only begun to start working with very large amounts of memory, which they couldn't do before. So this doesn't still scale with size. You still have a wrong scaling strategy, because your choke point is still here. And how much ever you may scale horizontally, you're going to land up having a choke point sitting here. And your system is better, still slow, nowhere harnessing the power of, of uh, memory speeds. Um, it is complex, simpler than before, but still doing transaction management. Still doesn't scale, is durable and consistent. Durability and consistency still coming from, keep in mind, synchronous replications across memory, across boxes, in order to allow for, for durable storage across, across uh, machines. That compromises on performance, but still gives you the durability and consistency. This was sort of the first, um, I'd say, um, first stage of evolution in sort of in-memory computing, where data grids were being born like a decade and a half ago. And at that point in time, you would see um, these kind of replicated data caches coming out. But all the data cache and data grid vendors sort of realized very, very quickly that this model of just having in-memory replicated state is not necessarily going to pan out for these reasons that I've listed out, and went to another model and started introducing some additional capabilities into the system. And those capabilities essentially are the capabilities of doing what are called data partitioning or data striping. In this model, what actually happens is, is rather than having a uh, you know, a, a in-memory replicated sort of data cache that effectively is a database but sitting in, in memory instead of on disk, you start re-architecting your applications a little bit. This is the beginning of the change of application architecture. And we call this uh, data gravity. And data gravity is essentially a combination of the striping of your data and very smart routing. Both go hand in hand. Striping of data is essentially, in the previous models, we saw that we horizontally scale our applications by basically just deploying a lot more units of business logic. Some data grid vendors call this function data collocation, um, where they actually bring the data to the function, or, take, or rather than take the function of data, or something like that. Um, in this, but, but in this model, the fundamental difference is that each of these partitions, slash shards, slash whatever term you want to use for them, they effectively have private data stores in memory. And private data stores are the one that actually allow you to scale horizontally. As size grows, you're in a position to be able to now scale linearly in a horizontal fashion by essentially deploying more, uh, sophist more business, business logic units plus more private data stores for that business logic. Which means that as size of the data grows, you're in a position to be able to scale and manage that particular size. As volume of the data grows, you're in a position to be able to manage that volume, regardless of whether the choke point is here or here. If the choke point is here or here, you're still in a position to be able to handle that by effectively deploying another partition that actually handles a portion of the data. However, this architecture is predicated on one very simple thing. You cannot do this without some kind of smart routing that sits at your messaging level. What happens is that you still can't do things like round robin. You can't do session-based load balancing. Those kind of things don't work anymore. Because a session-based load balancing is basically a load balancing using a metric that has nothing to do with the business. While you're scaling your, actually, your, your system using a metric that is business-oriented. For example, you would scale based on number of customers. You would scale based on number of symbols. You would scale based on number of firms. You would scale based on properties or some kind of uh, metric that is business-focused, not necessarily a technical-focused, which is actually sitting down here. 
Therefore, instead of actually having something like a, you know, synchronous JMS queue or having HTTP in order to actually transport your messages from your clients in, into your business logic for processing, you need some capability by which you can introspect into those particular messages. You can introspect into whatever is coming your way and decide as to what partition it pertains to and appropriately route it. That is the only way that you're now going to be able to create these parallel swim lanes which allow for concurrent parallel processing of your transactions. This is the first scaling moment that actually happens in application architectures that do high volume transaction processing. Now, as you notice over here, the reds have gone, which means that this becomes a viable architecture in order to manage it. You get pretty good response times. You manage a large amount of data. But still, it is a little bit slow. It's slower than memory. Why is it slower than memory? Because in most cases, these data, uh, um, data stores are sitting out of process, which means that you have synchronous hops actually to get from your business logic, which we call long polling out into another process in order to access your data. Plus, there are costs that need to be actually borne in order to stabilize that data. Stabilization of the data includes replication. Replication is going to actually incur a synchronous hop to another box. And there are you know, concerns around the speed of light on the network that actually prevent you from going faster than a certain amount. Most networks will allow you to be able to do synchronous hops, I mean, regular networks without investing a lot, will allow you to be able to do synchronous hops of, synchronous hops of maybe 5, 10,000 a second. You won't be able to go more than 5, 10,000. I mean, even that much is stretching it. Some of the more advanced networks now will allow you a little bit more. But even till about five years ago, you would maybe about 5 to 10,000 would be what you would be able to do. Now, you can scale that horizontally and start getting more and more and more. So you will start getting the speed. But there is a point beyond which you will not be able to scale. The reason for that is that because it's synchronous, the key part, because it's synchronous, and this whole pipe is synchronous, you cannot actually scale with one pipe. You need to have concurrent threads that actually push here, run here, and run here. Which means that your transaction boundaries are still going to be maintained within business logic. You still have to be concerned about isolation issues. You still have to be maintaining consistency in your core, in your business logic. And therefore, you land up in a situation where the complexity has not necessarily gone down that much. The speed has improved, but the speed only is synchronous, which basically means that you can't get latencies that are going to be better than a few hundred milliseconds. And, um, but the system will scale with size. So this system, although it can perform to a certain extent, which is, which is basically up there, it allows for um, it to scale from a, from a performance standpoint only up to a certain amount, but will not allow you to be able to harness the power of in-memory computing to its fullest. No microseconds, it's certainly no nanoseconds, and um, certainly no low milliseconds. You're talking about high hundreds of milliseconds and, um, and pretty complex. So just to kind of summarize that, how slow for systems such as this? Hundreds of milliseconds. If you're doing a latency, it'll be hundreds of milliseconds in order to kind of update data, fetch data. Um, what is the throughput if, now, this is a very important thing to consider, is that in systems such as this, if you are not in a position to be able to do concurrent processing, you are pretty much hosed. You cannot scale this system. The only way of scaling it is to go wide, is to basically open up just lots and lots of threads running and concurrently against that particular data store and against your business logic. If your application is of a nature that does not allow you to do this, like, for example, a trading system, you're in trouble. An e-commerce system, totally. It will scale. But still, so if you're working only with a single pipe, you just can't, you'll be in like, just imagine this. If you look at that latency of hundreds of milliseconds, you're talking about 5, 10 TPS if you only have a single pipe. If you have 100 threads and you have 10 TPS, you've got 1,000 TPS across the board. That is where you get these you know, thousands per second with high concurrency. And this is pretty much the reason why actually you are capped when it comes to performance is because you have to go wide. Each one of those threads can do it kind of low tens. Then you multiply that by the number of threads, and that's your aggregate throughput, which works very well in the, in the web world because you have millions of users who are using your system all coming in concurrently. However, for trading systems, for gaming engines, for ad bidding engines, you're in trouble. These things will not necessarily scale very well. 
So another thing which actually compromises on, well, I'll, I'll come back to, come, come to that in a minute. Um, why is this still so slow, right? So just to recap what I mentioned, it's running out of process in, oops, sorry. It's running out of process in many cases, therefore synchronous hops. You have synchronous data management and stabilization, which means that if it's running out of process, you actually got a long pole under that particular data cache, which actually will then have to stabilize it before responding to you. So two network hops, which takes it down from 10 TPS to 5 TPS. And then the concurrent transactions are not cheap. When you're actually having a lot of threads running in the system concurrently hitting your data store, managing that concurrency in the data store doesn't necessarily scale. That's one of the reasons why the databases have got like decades of research in order to try to make that scale. Because concurrency costs you when it comes to uh, managing the data. But also, equally importantly, it's not only the complexities of managing concurrency that cost you, but what also costs you is the fact that if you really want to go extreme, if you really want to go down to the low micros, if you want to go down to the nanos, you're talking about now not doing locks. You have to get to a point where you can't synchronize on, on data anymore because the act of synchronizing data will actually flush your processor caches. And flushing processor caches will take you from nanos to micros because you're always accessing main memory. So there's a notion of mechanical sympathy which actually also needs to be introduced when you go extreme. The, this kind of a model compromises on mechanical sympathy big time. You're not in a position to be able to be sympathetic to your hardware, and therefore you're not in a position to be able to harness the power of your hardware. And in complexity, the same story. Transaction management is still there. It's in the business logic, makes life a lot more complicated. Your, um, as I mentioned, thread management for concurrency, data transformation due to lack of structured data models. The last piece is also important. So when there is data transformation that actually needs to happen, right, um, it of course makes life very complicated, plus it makes life very slow. But why does data transformation need to happen? Very simply, because I as a Java programmer, I'm not in a position to be able to treat memory as a disk. I cannot rely on my Java data models to model my application, uh, my, my business data models. I'm not, I'm not in a position to do that. I have to transform from my application data models, which are in Java, to the data model capabilities that exist in my subsystem, which is managing my data, which are typically what the NoSQL movement did. It made structured data into completely you know, key value pairs. So now that transformation still needs to happen between what I'm doing with my business logic and the way I'm storing my data. That complexity still contributes a lot to the lack of agility in your code base. The idea is to merge that, move that away, and move to a place where you get structured data and allow you to be able to work with structured data models. What do we have to do to take it to the next level? Right? And you know, I have about 10 minutes left. I'm not going to spend too much of time on this. And you know, I'm more than happy to speak with anybody if you want to go into details. But I will kind of illustrate some of the um, elements of what needs to be done here. One is localize your application state. This whole long polling and putting your, your, um, your data um, in a process that is outside and you know, doing a synchronous hop there needs to go away. Bring it into in process. And lots of data vendors and data caches actually do this. You actually can have like, uh, data in your own process as the business logic. Um, the benefit of doing that is purely performance. It's really about performance because it it's effectively, instead of making a remote call, I'm doing a local call. I'm elim eliminating one network hop, and therefore I'm getting a little bit better performance. The real important thing that needs to be done that will actually elevate your performance is what is called multi-agency and transaction pipelining. Transaction pipelining <clears throat> is essentially, when a transaction actually starts, like for example, um, I get a request to make a room reservation. It's a, it's, a, it's a simple request. When a transaction starts, the thread that is actually managing that transaction in the architectures that we have talked about so far are going to actually block till the data that has been manipulated by that transaction is stabilized. It will block. That's a reason why you actually have to go wide and you have to actually uh, scale by going through multiple threads. In transaction pipelining, that effectively changes it. It says that it is a non-blocking paradigm. 
But a non-blocking paradigm basically means that I start my transaction. It's like what TCP has done you know, decades ago, as opposed to synchronous communication protocols that used to exist before that, is that there's no reason to actually not transmit the next message because the previous message is actually being processed. As long as you can have stabilization windows at play and you're in a position to be able to manage those stabilization windows effectively, you should be able to start a transaction and then start the next transaction on that same thread while the other transaction's in progress. However, in order to do that, there are certain things that actually ha go hand in hand. You can't do it without these other things. Those are that you have to now reach a point where your state is 100% in memory, which means the act of doing a transaction manipulates state in your own memory space, and there can be no interactions with the outside world till that transaction is complete. And all interaction with the outside world must happen through messaging. So you start adopting a more messaging-centric view of the world in your application that when a transaction starts, I go update my memory, and then I don't finish that transaction right away. I go through the process of stabilizing that transaction while processing the next transaction concurrently with the act of stabilization. Like, for example, make room reservation, go update your reservation object. And the reservation object, the change, can be replicated to your backups while you're actually doing the next reservation update. There's no reason you can't do that as long as it's predicated on only one thing, that the world should not know about the fact that the reservation was made till the stabilization is complete. That is what is critical. And therefore, all interactions with the world need to be hap happening through messaging. And it goes with this, that you treat outbound messages as state. I take my outbound messages which reflect my view of what I'm telling the world. And I will actually treat that as state, that as, as soon as my state is stabilized, I tell the world. Which means that if I couldn't stabilize my state, the transaction quote unquote failed, the world didn't know what I did. Because I'm operating locally in my memory. I'm doing everything in my memory. Nobody knows what happened till I told them through a message. That message never went out because my transaction failed. But, but that doesn't mean that I could not process subsequent transactions that are coming behind it. The next one is the moment you go into transaction pipelining, you actually now employ single-threaded business logic. You just moved away from concurrency altogether. If you have pipelining, you're not blocking. If you're not blocking, do it in a single thread. Single threads are very, very powerful. Single threads are not something to be frowned upon. They're extraordinarily powerful. They run on you know, gigahertz of power that's at our, at our fingertips. Why do we want to block? Let's use it. That's what single-threaded systems are about. And finally, structured state. If I have a single-threaded system that actually is doing my transactions in pipelines, and I'm working with the world as with using only messages, and I can actually just work with my application or my language's data modeling techniques, I've got agility, I've got speed, I've got scale, I've got everything that I need in order to take this to the next level. So these are the key elements that actually result in you know, elevating your, your, your system to the next level. Um, so this is essentially an uh, illustration of the same. Basically, you have the same architecture, same processing swim lanes, however, You've got single-threaded dispatch, which means that you typically don't work with number of threads beyond the number of actually partitions that you have. You're working with pure domain state, pipeline stabilization of your application state, which allow you to be able to do concurrent processing of an entire transaction pipeline, as well as um, move your application state fully into local memory, draw it all in. You basically collapsed your data and your, and your business logic tier into a transaction processing tier separate from the messaging tier. It gives you speed, gives you durability, consistency, it scales, and it really is simple. How fast is this? Hundreds of microseconds to low milliseconds. And I'll give you an example of an application that we wrote that actually took um, that long. Throughput, hundreds of thousands, million transactions a second. We can do millions without a problem because this is the paradigm that actually allows you to do it. What are the issues with this? Um, if you're working with traditional JVMs, you're going to get jitter. You're going to get garbage collection jitters. You work with huge data spaces, you're going to get massive amounts of jitters. So jitter is still a problem. You can get good performance, good throughput, but jitter will be an issue. And so therefore, if you really want to go with ultra low latency, there is some additional work that needs to be done. But this is, this is really the, the, the fundamental step that one needs to take 
to get to this level of performance and agility. To get to the next level, which is now we are talking about ultra low latency, which is like you know, you know, few micros um, latency, you have to do two, two things. One is you really have to get to a point where you eliminate all kinds of inter-tier transformations. You know, from the messaging layer to your business logic layer to your data layer, there cannot be any buffer copies, there cannot be anything that, that happens in order to um, you know, transport your data across these different tiers. Now this is really going into the extremes, into the weeds when it comes to extreme transaction processing. And then finally, eliminate garbage. When you do this, you basically got down to tens of micros, you've got down to no jitter, completely flat, um, you know, performance profiles, and hundreds of thousands to millions of transactions a second. An example. So, MGM Resorts is actually um, a customer of ours. So I'm just going to talk through a couple of examples before I run out of time. Um, MGM Resorts is an example. If you have any questions about this, you can please talk to Rick Heil. He's actually sitting right here. He's uh, the chief application architect and di director of the e-commerce unit. He can ratify everything that I've said here. Um, so essentially, it is, um, they run their entire e-commerce suite on the X platform. The most significant thing over here, which I want to highlight since I'm running out of time, is actually this point. If you go to any of the MGM websites, you go to any of the resorts that are there from the MGM resorts, and you go to their website, and you go and click on book a room, you will see that it brings up a calendar of 14 months. That 14-month calendar is actually got prices in it. Every time somebody lands on that particular page, it is actually fetching prices for the entire 14-month window from the back-end system, and that price is not coming from a catalog. That price is coming from a combination of a catalog, of who you are as a customer, wh what, trip your, what, what your trip looks like, which channel you're actually coming from, what your history with the company is. Everything is taken into account to actually give you a price. That price is computed from memory and responded to you in sub 500 milliseconds. So this is still sitting in that domain, which is where you're getting 500 milliseconds, and there are about 20, 30 TPS, and there are massive amounts of data that have been shoveled down the pipe in order to basically get 500 milliseconds response time. There was another, um, uh, that's the e-commerce system we talked about. There was the SSO storage engine that actually was authored on top of the X platform, which is the platform that Neve Research um, has authored, um, to talk about agility to be able to give you fast, quick applications. It took an entire SSO uh, storage engine to be written on the X platform, three hours. Three hours to write a distributed hash map that allowed people to be able to store all the SSO, um, all the SSO session IDs uh, for single sign-on. It was written in three hours. It was in production in a week. This is because of what we talked about before, the capability of working with pure Java treating memory as a disk, to be able to do pipelining, the ability to be able to, 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 to do everything that was there on the previous slide, which allows results in this. It is, in three hours, it does like you know, tens of thousands of transactions a second, sub 10 milliseconds, all right out of the box in three hours. Yeah, actually, it's microseconds. Sorry, sorry, my bad, it's microseconds. So, so um, this is an example of, of, of you know, what happened at MGM Resorts. There is um, another customer which actually is a tier one investment bank in Wall Street. They're the ones who actually go for extreme, uh, the, the real extreme where they're doing trading systems, the entire equities uh, department runs on, on X. They run less than 100 microseconds client to market latencies, which is zero jitter. It's a flat, 100% Java. It is less than 100 microseconds from the point that it comes from the client on the network to the point that it leaves for the market on the network, full processing, less than 100 microseconds. And that's, that was because of all the different implement, all the uh, facets that we discussed in the previous slide. IoT, so it's so the last slide before we take, uh, take some um, questions. Um, so last night, it's funnily enough, this actually happened last night. Last night, a few members from Neve Research decided that, you know what, we're going to see if we can actually see, do something in IoT. You know, what can we do? It's in a hot space. There's something that we would like to do. So what is it we can do? So somebody thought up um, an application thinking that if you have, say, a mobile vehicle pool where they're actually pushing um, 
you know, a lot of location events into the system, and you want to do geofencing around them, how much can we actually handle in terms of events? You like pump as many events as you can in the system, go through the geofencing logic that you write in business logic, see what it takes in order to kind of figure out whether an app, a particular truck has left their geofence, and how many can you process, and in the event of a notification, how long does it take from the time you get the event to the time the notification goes out? The system actually processed in a single shard, single JVM, single CPU socket, with basically only four uh, cores in there, can do 400,000 transactions a second. This is zero jitter. 400,000 transactions a second, response times of 1.7 milliseconds for these 400,000 transactions a second, all 100% pure Java. This is not, nothing happening outside of Java. And the business logic was less than 100 lines of code, which had to be since they wrote it last night. And it runs on one CPU socket and stock hardware. There is really no extra hardware. These are G8 machines that were bought actually secondhand, dropped in, and, and clustered and run. So if you implement all the facilities that we talked about before, and don't get me wrong, they're not easy to implement. But if you implement those facilities, it is this that you result in. This is extreme transaction processing. And it is finally possible in today's world, um, in the in-memory space, uh, to get this kind of stuff, which was unheard of before. But it's fully reliable, 100% fault tolerant, 400,000 transactions a second. And if you shard them out, you're talking millions of transactions a second. Fully fault tolerant. So with that, I will end. And if there are any questions, um, I will take them now. Oh, I probably better take them at the back. At the back? Yeah, the next talk is supposed to start. Oh. oh, OK. I'm sorry. I thought it was. OK, so in the back means. Yeah, yeah. so people, yeah, just go ahead and watch you meet them right, right outside the door. Right outside the door? OK, so I'll walk out there. Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah.